welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley speaking from Washington, D.C. We tried to make some technical improvements this week, hoping for the best. Uh, and let's see what happens. Now, this is the program being recorded on August 1st, the afternoon of August 1st. And, of course, we're passing through the anniversaries of the beginning of World War One. And in, I would point in particular to the anniversary yesterday, the assassination of the great French socialist leader Jean Jaurès, J-A-U-R-E-S, with a little accent on the last E. And he was assassinated 100 years ago yesterday as he was organizing a general strike and this was a general strike against war the entire socialist international had pledged that if the imperialist finance bourgeoisie started a world war that uh, they would stop them in their tracks with a general strike and the one significant leader, the most prominent leader of the Second International who attempted to make good on that pledge was Jean Jaurès. So he is a hero for us from many points of view. Maybe we can give you some quotes from some of his great speeches. I'll certainly try to in the final segment. But uh, he was he was organizing that general strike. And that reminds us, if something's going on you really don't like, uh, you got to consider – a general strike as the possible answer. And uh, on the other hand, there's no good calling for a general strike left and right. you got to have some reasonable hope that it's going to be carried out. Right? Although sometimes you just have to have to do it. All right. Um, we have to, first of all, address this question of the Ukrainian false flag warnings. And this comes from Commander Strelkov of the Donetsk People's Republic, uh, DNR, Donetskaya Narodnaya Respublik, I guess. Um, and they're talking about plans being matured by the Kiev fascist clique for a large, stunning false flag operation. One of the reasons they do this, and I, I've been aware of this for many years for other you know, constructive political purposes, but July and August are the months when the news flow declines and you can get the mass media to cover things, especially in Europe and especially in France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Bavaria, these areas where August 15th, everything shuts down as uh, more, more than any other time of the year, this is when you can get stories covered. And remember, the Guta fraud was a year ago, right? The fake NATO false flag attempt to blame chemical weapons on the Assad government of Syria. That's last August. And now we're going into that danger zone of false flag season we might say uh, the year before, of course, it was the attempted coup d'etat by Ben Rhodes and company using television as well as bombs to try to overthrow Assad with a decapitating strike. Well, it turned out that the modern state in the form of Syria was stronger than these imperial attempts. Right. The, the modern state is stronger than the empire. That has been, I think, shown in uh, in wars, <laughs> but now um, you can see what, what we're going into. So here's the point. Strelkov and company have had a press conference, and the most uh, detailed I have here in German, commanders of the Donetsk People's Republic warn about a uh, an imminent in, uh, orchestrated faked terror attack by the Kiev fascist clique, the Secret Service of the People's Republic of Donetsk has, has told the political leaders there that the Ukrainian army is preparing a big time provocation. The goal of the provocation is to uh, to 
stamp the Donetsk People's Republic as a terrorist organization and attempt to blame it for the killing of the civilian population. And this time they've come up with an idea goes beyond their phosphorus bombs that they have been using. It goes beyond the ballistic missiles that the Kiev fascist clique has been firing. Uh, and it's going to be something like this. Um, a, a rocket attack uh, on uh, – it will be rocket attacks, rocket ballistic missiles with uh, uh, the goal of attacking – the uh, water treatment plants and other facilities where chemicals are stored in Donetsk and Lugansk. And the specific is in uh, one of the water uh, treatment plants in Donetsk, there is about 120 tons of chlorine and in another one, 160 tons of chlorine. Another possible target is a uh, chemical facility with ammonia uh, present, and that is in Golovka. And the idea is that there will be these ballistic missile attacks and then a p propaganda campaign to discredit the People's Republic of Donetsk and to try to implicate the separatist uh, militia. Uh, these are, of course, uh, atrocities that will be done by the Ukrainian army, in effect, against the civilian population and then the, the this announcement goes into the question of which way will the wind be blowing as the chlorine cloud comes back down then um it's got a uh, large uh area it's got a large radius of uh of uh, effect and uh most forms of life or all forms of life will tend to die in that uh area tens of thousands of people can die and uh, maybe more depending on which way the wind is actually uh, blowing. So uh, he stresses that the militia of the Donetsk People's Republic and the People's Republic of Lugansk will not carry out any terror attacks against their own population, not against the Ukrainian troops, not against uh, – Anybody as long and their their main goal is to uh, protect the civilian population from these uh, from these effects. So this is now a false flag alert, and it comes from Colonel Igor Girkin, and uh, and also from uh, from uh, Strelkov. Now let's talk a little bit also about some other details. There are fragmentary reports of this on the uh, Internet. Um, the, uh, the resistance, uh, the anti-Kiev uh, groups, have received information that in the next few days, Kiev neo-Nazis are planning a terrorist act, one or several, in the large cities of Ukraine. Now, this is slightly different. This is that they're going to do a uh, an own goal, right? An eigentor, an autorete in the western part, maybe in Lvov, uh, and then blame that on the Russians and their separatist uh, separatist friends. So the resistance received information that in the next few days the neo Nazis are planning a terrorist act in large cities of Ukraine. Avakov and um, his deputy, Abakov is the interior minister of the, of the uh, Kiev uh, clique, during recent days have already provided informational cover-up for these actions. The minimum goal is to impose a total dictatorship over Ukraine, pretending it was Russia implementing the terrorist attacks. The optimal goal adds invasion of Ukraine by Polish, Lithuanian, and possibly other NATO troops. We'll be back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. It's uh, August 1st, 2014, a hundred years since Germany declared war on Russia and France and Germany mobilized and uh, Italy declared neutrality. That's a hundred years ago at the beginning of World War One. And this is the heavy duty stuff actually began today, although the Russian mobilization had been going also on the uh, ordered on the 30th and then uh, implemented on the 31st. 
So we're looking at these two classes of possible false flag, right? One is the Ukrainian forces, the Soldateska, fire a ballistic missile at these chlorine or ammonia deposits in the eastern cities. Another one is an operation supposedly called Spalahu Diembrievi. Spalahu Diembrievi. Uh, we'll check what that might mean. Uh, a, a SBU, a Ukrainian KGB major, calling himself Alexei Nikonov, uh, who is uh, part of this ruling clique. Uh, and the idea is that they want to have a a, a false flag on their own territory, Reichstag fire uh, equivalent, and um, and then blame that on the eastern Ukrainians and of course on on uh, on Russia. So that combination is uh, extremely dangerous, and you've got to inoculate people. And I, I would stress all of those who gave energy, time, gave up their substance. In other words. In the 9-11 truth movement, now is the possible payoff of this. In other words, what we're going to find out possibly here is how much skepticism, how much sophistication and intelligence we've been able to inculcate into the U.S. population, European and other populations concerning this mother of all false flags. So far, the 9-11 fraud, September 11, 2001, uh, have we done our work? Have we built it better than we knew or not so good as we had hoped? So we're going we're gonna to find that out. But don't believe it. In other words, everybody brace yourself because we are now going into this territory. And remember that the goal of a lot of this stuff is it's not so much triggered by anything in Ukraine. I mean, obviously, there are things going on in Ukraine. One is that the, the government is tending to fall apart, right? Yatsenyuk, the great IMF uh, uh, austerity shock therapy enforcer, Yatsenyuk has uh, been voted out, but they won't. Uh, uh, Turchinov and, uh, and Porno, Pornoshenko. Uh, Pornoshenko won't accept his resignation, so they want him in there. Of course, he was the darling of uh, Madame Newland. And um, then um, the other side of it is, of course, that the Ukrainian armed forces are having a hell of a time. They got desertions. They've got um, a, a member of the Kiev Rada of the fascist clique had gone to, I think, even western Ukraine and uh, tried to recruit people into the uh, military, and they um, they treated him rather roughly. I think they beat him up. So um, that's uh, interesting. So they got all kinds of problems. And the political crisis, of course, is that the IMF shock therapy is now beginning to bite. So there are plenty of reasons on the ground. But the big one is the BRICS bank. It is this idea that for the first time since 1944 – there is an alternative game in town. It's not just the Anglo-Americans and their crushing neoliberal and libertarian uh, Washington consensus conditionalities. Now you've also got the possibility of other uh, other things, right? The BRICS Bank is the other thing. And we got, we've got to switch in just a second to um, to the big picture on this. But this a, a, a false flag of this size – in uh, in Ukraine is going to be the goal of it is going to be to try to stabilize this rotten international financial system and of course the New York courts that um, that play along with it. But let's just look at a couple of other things. Um, so Kiev has these ballistic missiles. That's well known, sort of short range. Uh, their fighting is is uh, continuing. The Ki a Kiev uh, convoy was ambushed overnight by the pro-Russian uh, forces, uh, and uh, we have 
the uh, the big lie campaign continues, right? The BBC had posted some um, eyewitness reports, right? Uh, people in the vicinity who had seen the crash of the Malaysian MH17 airliner and talked about one or two fighter jets in the vicinity flying right underneath. <laughs> and uh, that has now been sanitized. It's been taken away. And, of course, uh, I want to direct you once again to my Twitter page, tarpley.net, and there you're going to find that uh, a German pilot has come up with an, uh, an, an analysis of the crash site. Right? It's essentially based on uh, one picture in particular – and it's uh, the the picture is uh, you can see it on my uh, Twitter feed there, and it, what it shows is that the outer skin of the fuselage in the cockpit area shows entry holes of what is thought what are thought to have been thirty millimeter cannon slugs. Now those can be explosive slugs or they can be shrapnel slugs. Um, and you can see there's a, you can make a case that some of them are going in, right? The jagged edges are pushed inside the fuselage. In other cases, the jagged edges are coming from outside the fuselage, indicating that it could be a, uh, uh, shots, slugs that were fired through the fuselage and are coming now out the other side. So there's a, a significant, um, argument now against the official version, once again, and uh, we've also got a, uh, a an official of the former German uh, East German Army, the Nationale Volksarmee. Yes, a colonel from the NVA, NVA. He says that he knows all about Buk, Sam Eleven, and so forth because he used them. And if they hit a plane. The entire plane bursts into flames because of the huge uh, impact inside uh, the, the cabin and the fuselage and so forth. And that does not seem to have been the case here. In other words, a, a high altitude fire and a total explosion of everything. That doesn't seem to be the, uh, the case here. So back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. And we're very much uh, on the brink. A hundred years after the outbreak of World War I. People have learned precious little. Now, uh, a couple of other aspects on this Ukrainian story. Oh, the British ambassador here in Washington is engaging in conduct which is clearly incompatible with his diplomatic status, and he's got to be essentially uh, PNG. He's got to be declared persona non grata right? he's got to be told get out what you're doing is unacceptable and you are interfering with um, you know normal relations of the united states with other uh countries and what's this character's name we're going to get him in a minute if we can uh, if we can find him in the notes but you uh you get the idea. Uh, he went on MSNBC and talked about Putin. He's a liar. He's the thug. Well, that's that's uh, you're just supposed to be a diplomat. That's not your job. If you want to do that, go home to Great Britain and uh, and promote war there. But don't try to drag the American people into war by using MSNBC as your soapbox. Peter Westman Westmacott. W-E-S-T-M-A-C-O-T-T. There it is. Let's see. It's been retweeted uh, 25 times. Um, PNG, this guy, persona non grata, a thug and a liar, uh, which I think that's also the headline of the um, of the uh, <laughs> the London Economist, right? A web of lies. <laughs> OK, so get rid of him. Uh, it is interesting that the traditional 19th century opposition, that the most virulent hatred of Russia comes from the British. And I hope our Russian friends take note of that. Right. The most incorrigible Russia haters are indeed 
the um, British. So, National Public Radio this morning on the Diane Rehm Show, they were telling us nobody doubts the essential NATO narrative that the Malaysian airliner was shot down by a surface-to-air missile in the hands of the rebels, but probably supplied by Russia. Well, I'm sorry, I don't believe it. I'm somebody, I think, and I don't believe it. And when you hear these, when you hear oligarchs saying nobody wants and everybody knows, you know that they are oligarchs and they are lying. Now, um, we've also got Israel and Hamas. I've had the opportunity this week to uh, to talk about this in a number of uh, places, and I refer you to those, right, most prominently on press TV and uh, things, of course, have gotten worse there in the meantime. Uh, another, yet another ceasefire has collapsed and the, the killing goes on. Up now, about 1,500 Palestinians have been killed. That is to say, five times as many as the Malaysian airliner, which was somehow supposed to stop the world. And of course, most of these are civilians. Many of them are children. These are barbaric atrocities. So uh, we've also got unprecedented uh, clashes between the Israelis and the U.S. Now, these, of course, are not principled clashes. They're ma matters of perception and ego and uh, personality and so forth. But uh, some of these things can blossom into more serious uh, divergences. So... Um, we hope that this will happen. Of course, Kerry, Kerry Skull and Bones Kerry today has proved himself once again to be a gutless wonder. He's got a st statement out condemning Hamas, but saying nothing at all about uh, the Israelis. The U.S. is also resupplying the Israelis, which undercuts any statement that they make. However, here's, here's what I would recommend. Based on the conversations I had on uh, on press TV, I would point to a couple of things. Uh, first of all, you got to make demands, right? Look at my web page. Uh, there's a world consensus, I think, for a ceasefire, but now an end to the occupation and the blockade. You've got to always talk about the occupation and the blockade because most people do not know. The line here is, oh, well, if uh, Mexico and Canada were firing missiles into the United States, then uh, the U.S. wouldn't hesitate. We would strike back. Yeah. But you're not occupying and blockading Canada and Mexico, right? If you were occupying and blockading, maybe you wouldn't be so surprised if somebody tried to fight back because they probably would. Um, the, uh, the other great need, a Geneva conference for the Middle East based on a Marshall Plan for the reconstruction and development of the entire region. Now, virtually every country, including Israel, has been destroyed one way or the other by war. This includes Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, uh, Somalia, uh, on and on, right? Uh, so this is what you need. There's got to be that kind of a, uh, of a peace conference and those, those thorny issues, right, principally the three, right? The final status of Jerusalem, the right of return, and the settlements – all of those are going to have to be finessed, and the finessing of those has got to be lubricated with lots of money. But on the other hand, this is much cheaper than warfare, which otherwise can grow out of this. The problem with the Israeli-Palestinian situation, as well as the uh, situation with, the, with Ukraine, is that the longer these go on, the more opportunity there is for these forces of evil – as we see, to meddle, right, to fish in the troubled waters, to set up false flag events, to try to escalate them, and so forth. And we've also, we must also add that the uh, Syrian front is once again becoming a, a serious uh, problem, uh, and that is to say, the uh, ISIS forces have captured a Syrian army base in the northern province of Raqqa, and they have killed um, 50 or 60. They've executed summarily 50 Syrian soldiers, 20 more killed in a double suicide bombing, and 16 more killed in action. Some of them uh, beheaded, some of them crucified, some of them with their heads displayed on Pikes, 
the enemies of civilization are once again on the march. ISIS is one of them. It looks like they've taken some of that military gear they captured in Iraq and they've shifted it back for use against Assad. And you do have at the same time, I think, a backlash of the Kurds once again, that the Kurds are fighting uh, on the Syrian side, I think, rather more uh, energetically against ISIS than perhaps uh, in other places. Okay, and you can see um, you can see this uh, discussion on Tarpley.net. This was Press TV on the um, on the 29th, I believe. So um, let's look at all of it. Um, Libya, <laughs> right now. This, this is the wonderful fruits of humanitarian bombing. We can thank Samantha Power and her coterie. We can thank uh, the, uh, the responsibility to protect gang. Libya has gone from the best standing on the United Nations Human Development Index. They were tops in Africa. They were ahead of other countries. They were ahead, as I recall, of Brazil, ahead of Ukraine. And now they are a failed state. They have gone into hell as a result of this damn meddling and the bombing of March 2011. Bernard-Henri Lévy had his hands in this operation. Sarkozy, don't forget it. Um, the U.S. diplomats have all fled. Total chaos. And will that become a terror base? Well, how can it become anything else? Um, in that uh, in that context, so there's uh, some kind of a sketch of what's happening in the world. But now we got to go over to Ecofin, and we'll be back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio, August first, twenty fourteen. Um, we are of course looking forward to uh, getting some news from Nebraska in the course of the next uh, week or ten days about uh, the. Uh, ballot situation and we're we're rooting for Dan Burdorf and his campaign to uh be able to challenge Ben Sass and Domina and in particular there is that um debate sponsored by the Cattlemen's Association in western Nebraska which would become a showcase I think for the bankruptcy of both the reactionary Republican and the Wall Street Democrat point of view. And again, you're going to be a Wall Street Democrat unless you make an effort not to be one. Right? You got to do something about that. So um, I think you uh, you get the idea. So we're hoping for that. Uh, Dan Burdoff. Remember, it's Dan for Nebraska dot com. Dan for Nebraska dot com. We're very much in the thick of things out there. And we're hoping to have some uh, some news for you. Uh, soon. Now, let's let's look at the bigger picture, though. Right. Look at this um, economic situation right now. We've got the U.S. centered Bretton Woods system based on the dollar and the court of last resort is in New York City. Well, Argentina has now been forced into default by a group of hedge fund hyenas. That is to say, uh, uh, Singer, a guy called Singer, and his uh, Elliott Fund have successfully argued in a New York City federal district court that uh, the settlements made by the Argentinian government with various creditors are not kosher and that therefore they should uh, get all their money, right? They want to be paid in full. And astoundingly enough, the New York federal judge has embraced the creditors, not even the creditors, because these are a minority of the creditors. They represent about six to seven percent of the creditors of Argentina. These are bottom fishers, right? They've gone into the secondary market, bought this stuff up for pennies on the dollar, and now they want to get a bonanza windfall by getting paid in full. By the way, let me point, let me hasten to point out. Paul Elliott Singer is a libertarian. Hey, libertarians, is he one of you? Is this what it means to be a libertarian like Peter Thiel or somebody like this? In this case, the biggest hedge fund predator 
uh, attacking Argentina is a libertarian. So uh, I'll be really interested to hear how our libertarian friends respond to this because that's a country of 41 million people. They go on the chopping block, right? And the Argentinians are fighting back. President Rodriguez de Kirchner, you'll remember her. She was slandered by uh, by Assange in the WikiLeaks document dump. Wasn't that interesting? Um, the Buitres, the Vulture Funds, right? The Locust Funds, the Hedge Fund Hyenas are attacking. And remember, this is um, a debt situation where about 30 percent of the Argentinian Foreign debt is dollar denominated. Other parts are Argentine peso denominated and euro denominated. And um, unfortunately, some of these have a clause that the uh, the jurisdiction is in New York. Some of them have a clause, unfortunately, that all creditors have to be uh, treated equally. I'm, yeah, that's fine. I'm sure they have a clause that they want to be paid in full, too, but it's not physically possible. So the physical universe rules out. The uh, the goal here of the uh, of the hedge funds and um, well, this uh, has not only pushed Argentina into default. Now they were they were in default under Rodriguez Sa, one of my favorite people, declared a uh, debt moratorium back in 2001. It was overtaken by the uh, 9-11 events, but it was a big deal at the time. So Argentina now in a default for the second time. The attempt is, um, for example, the Wall Street Journal. They want to minimize this. We can see it. We can see where they put the uh, the article. I have the Wall Street Journal of today. We look on the front page. Nothing about Argentina. There's a stock tumble, but there's nothing about Argentina, and you've got to flip through. Oh, my gosh, I'm turning the pages here. Oh, it's on page A6, down in the bottom left-hand corner of the page. And here we find Argentina awoke, Argentinians awoke Thursday to find their country was once again a financial pariah after President Cristina Kirchner, a populist known for picking political fights, stared down Wall Street hedge funds and pushed her country into its second default in 13 years. Now, that's ridiculous. She didn't push. The push came from the uh, vulture funds. They do have an editorial, Argentina, solo deadbeat. The government of Argentina has done it again by flouting the rule of law and vilifying foreign investors. President Cristina Kirchner succeeded in driving the country into its second default in 13 years. Oh, they're so sad. Uh, and here we have all kinds of stuff. Um, should we have a global bankruptcy court? Well, that sounds like a good idea to me, and I think that might be written in that might be a good thing for the people at the BRICS bank to uh, to look at. Because, look, let's look at this situation now. Argentina driven into default. In the case of Greece, we've got a country which has been repeatedly raped. We've got some others in uh, various parts of Europe. But in particular in Greece, we've got Alexis Tsipras soon to become the prime minister of Greece at the time of the next uh, election. And then uh, they're messing also with Russia. Uh, the U.S. courts uh, have uh, stated that there has to be a $50 billion payment to the predators of Yukos. You remember Khodorkovsky. Khodorkovsky using that, I think, faulty method of analogy, right? Sometimes you find this in Russia, right? Analogy between foreign conditions, Russian conditions. Um, well, uh, in this case, it was Berlusconi, right? Karakovsky argued, hey, I'm, I'm the richest man in Russia. If Berlusconi is the richest in Italy and gets to be president, then I have to have a coup and I'm going to take over the government. And Putin was there to say no. So uh, isn't that uh, interesting? Um, so uh, 50 billion, according to the U.S., and the European Union gets into the act with 1.9 billion euros, uh, also for the Yukos shareholders. The British are gearing up the Litvinenka case again. And notice the French are getting bashed because they want to sell some helicopter carriers to uh, Russia. Uh, then we've, and this, of course, comes as we've got the second round 
of sanctions this past 10-day uh, period, right? U.S. the previous week and now some more sanctions from the European Union this week. Sperbank, the biggest Russian bank now under uh, attack. So uh, from Argentina to Greece to Russia to France. Um, and then, you know, you got to look at Germany. They uh, they want to be respectable, of course, right? They're going to pay. <coughs> but still, um, some of those big uh, executives there realize that the sanctions are economic suicide for them. And uh, Italy, not far behind. And remember those interesting reports that the Russians are working on the new prime minister, Renzi. What I'm looking at here is the possibility of a jailbreak of a move by all of these countries. Um, you've got to respond to the fact that the U.S. government is not capable of administering what is supposed to be a world financial system. You cannot have a multilateral universal financial system, which is then in practice administered for the narrow, immediate, short-term benefit of the sociopathic elements in one of the countries, right? Maybe one of the more important ones, but still just just one of many. So the Bretton Woods remnants are not viable. They're just not viable. And people are going to break out. And that's what we've got to be looking at. That, I think, is what's, what's going to be the issue if there's a false flag in Ukraine. Back in a minute. Welcome back to the second hour now of World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley reporting from Washington, D.C. in the midst of a very hot uh, world situation. We're going to have more on this crisis of the uh, international financial system and its legal dimensions. The New York Fed attacking Deutsche Bank saying, you're overexposed to derivatives. You're a systemic risk. Wait a minute. Who is overexposed to derivatives, right? It's, this is, uh, this is uh, a, an interesting blame game. But now let's uh, catch up with our friend Reverend Edward Pinckney out in uh, Michigan in Benton Harbor and also looking into the Detroit water crisis and related stuff. Reverend, welcome once again. Hope you're doing well. Webster, I am doing tremendous, and <laughs> I, I, I really, really want to thank you so much for all the people who have called me, uh, f that have listened to your show and heard me on this show, and they have called me and uh, telling me that they're in total solidarity with me. I, it, it's been tremendous. I, I, I tell you, it's been a blessing. But listen, let me tell you what have happened within the last week. Um, I was, I had a court hearing, and they told me they want to know why I ain't spreading the word around that the judge said ju the judge rule evidence is not needed to bring the actors to trial. That was one of my emails that I sent out, and it's obvious they're monitoring my email. So I told them that. Is it not true that that's what you both said? The prosecutor said this. Judge uh, Sterling uh, Chirac said this. And also Judge uh, uh, Lasada. I said, is that not true what you said? If you didn't say that, one well, didn't correct me. He said, well, we didn't exactly use those words. I said, well, what words did you use? He said that it might be circumstantial evidence. I said, what is circumstantial evidence? That's not, that's not evidence. Ain't that, and so now so they got real mad about it. They were trying to uh, silence me again. And unfortunately, my, my attorney didn't go for it. See, it shows you what you can do when you start spreading the word and uh, uh, telling people the truth. You see, if, if I'm not telling the truth, tell me and I'll correct it. It's really just that simple. So they're, they're, they're very afraid right now. They're very intimidated right now. Instead of they're, they're, them intimidating me, I'm intimidating them. Well, so now I, I tell you, I really want to thank you for allowing me to be on your show and also to spread the word like I do. Because without you, I don't know where I would be. <laughs> We're delighted to do it. And uh, people around the world need to know about this because we, we can't wait for the Associated Press and CNN. They're not going to cover it. New York Times... Probably not too interested. Maybe they will be at some point, though. Then we'll know that something has changed. Absolutely, but that probably will not happen, not in, not in my lifetime, I don't believe. <laughs> but let's, let's hope and pray it do happen. <laughs> so, you know, but we're, we're yeah, still battling. We got a big election coming up Tuesday. We got two people we're trying to put into the county commissioner seats. And uh, 
we we one of them we we are very confident with. The other one is a little bit shaky, but the point is we're doing what we need to do, and they're doing everything they can to stop us. There's there's about forty people that they do not want me to talk to that they claim going to be witnesses at my trial who are actually my voters, but I have to tell them that they have to get out there and vote. They're doing what they're supposed to do do everything they can to stop me. I didn't realize I was such a big threat to them. I also mentioned what, during the hearing, I said, did you know that the, the SWAT team came to my home? And uh, uh, my attorney said, well, no, no, let me say it, you know, which I guess he was right. But it just blurted, I just blurted it out, you know. And uh, he said, he told the judge, did you know that the SWAT team came to his house? And uh, they, they was all looking like they were so shocked, you know, they couldn't believe it, right? So he said, well, what kind of action is that, you know, for a recall petition? It's, you know, and so it was it was amazing. I, I tell you, Webb, I, I really had now, a Webber, let me week. just get this straight because we want to make sure that people vote. Now, you're talking a city council election in Benton Harbor. Yes, that is, not the city council is the county commission, the county. What ca what's the name of the county It's Berrien County, Berrien County. Absolutely. And what's, what day? What what day can people vote from when to when? And they can they can get absentee? Voting, they can start voting today up until Tuesday, and you can go you can go go to the city clerk and vote. And we okay. want you to vote for Lisa Gully, and we want you to vote for Joe Taylor. Don't Lisa Gully and Joe Taylor. That is correct. Okay, those are the uh, anti whirlpool candidates. I take absolutely, it. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. They're anti, and also the whirlpool uh, uh, put out a commercial for the mayor here to try to <laughs> to change people uh, the way they think about him now. Because remember, I told you it used to be thirty five, sixty five his favor. Now it's sixty five, thirty five my favor or better. So it, it, it's been a lot of changes, and we we still balance. We're not giving up, and we're not quitting. And it shows what you can do if we learn to work together. We have to fight these folks together and show them what we're capable of doing. We gotta fight back. And this is just not just here in Benton Harbor; it's all over the country. Let me tell you something else about Detroit and the water fight. The water fight has gone viral. Is this this water fight is so big because it's not just now in Detroit; it's spreading across the country now. So the people have to get themselves prepared to understand that they want all the water they can get, and if you live by the water, they're going to try to remove you any way they can. Hmm. So That's we're shocking. there, uh, Webster. We're we're there, and we're fighting, and we're, and we're showing them. What we are capable of doing because you have to fight back. Somebody got to stand up and, and, and fight these people before it's too late. And they may have all the financial resources, but we have all the manpower. And that's what I keep telling people is more of us than them. And once they get that through their heads, we can deal with it and defeat them. Certainly, whatever happens in Benton Harbor and Detroit with these emergency managers and this brutal austerity, that may be in Detroit this year, but it's coming to all over America, all over the world, faster than, than anybody can uh, can imagine. Reverend, you got to tell people now how they can contact you, how they can send you support, contributions, and absolutely, so forth. Let's go through absolutely. it. Absolutely. You can call me at 269-925-0001. That's 269 925 Zero 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 one, or you can mail a check to Banco B A N C O, nineteen forty Union Avenue, Benton Harbor, Michigan, four nine zero two two. That's Banco B A N C O, nineteen forty Union Avenue, Benton Harbor, Michigan, four nine zero two two. Or you can go to my website, which is B H. B A N C O dot O. B H B A N C O dot O. You can go to my website and it'll keep you up to date on everything that's happening. And uh, we're going to be talking about this election. We're going to be talking about things that's happening. And they're trying to control us. They're trying to silence me once again. And we're not going to go for it. All right, Reverend. 
what's what's the calendar now? What are we looking forward to? Uh, we have an election this coming Tuesday. That is correct. Uh, the day after tomorrow, the practically. Election. A couple of days from now. Yeah, absolutely. And, we, and is that a Democratic prepared. primary or a final election? It's a it's a primary. It's a primary. Okay. Yes, absolutely. So once whoever wins the primary usually wins the big election. So that's what we're shooting for. So the Democratic primary is tantamount to winning the seat on the county council. Absolutely. Okay. And, and then beyond life. that, what does it look like? It looks good. We're looking good. We're looking like we know we we can really do some damage. And what what I'm trying to teach people, uh, you can't win unless you fight. And 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 that's my motto. That's what I'm I'm telling people. You have to get out there and do things. It's not about you. It's about the future. And we got to deal with the future right now before it's too late. Very good. And. Uh... How are people faring? I mean, do you know some people who've got their water cut off? Oh, quite a few. Quite a few. That's just But a when they cut them off, we cut them back on. <laughs> That's, That's right. How we do the that. Mon- you, th- you threw a monkey wrench into their plans. Absolutely. When you, when you cut the water off, we cut it right back on. And, and, and they hate that because now they, don't, they won't know that the water is off until they come out. And, and if, if your water cut off, they have no reason to come out and read your meter. <laughs> Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. Our program for the, uh, well, we're recording it on the uh, 1st of August uh, 2014. But now uh, we want to go to New York State and the uh, very interesting campaign for governor. That is, who should replace um, uh, the, the Cuomo uh, regime there in Albany, and uh, no better source than Randy Credico, who yes, is I now officially certified. Randy Credico is officially certified on the Democratic primary ballot uh, in early September. Randy, welcome. Hello. Yes, Randy. Can you hear me? Yes. Now? Listen, I'm gonna. You, you, you're gonna have to call me back on another line. This, this phone is for some reason not uh, working right. Okay, Hello? well, then maybe our maybe the control room can take care of that, can we? Can you do that? I think Back so. The Let's original try it. line, guys. The original line. Okay. For some reason, so this that's phone Randy is like dying on me. running for governor of New York and um, in the Democratic primary. And we're going to get him to tell us what day the Democratic primary is. We're going to get him to tell us all about early voting and uh, other ways to express your support. But, of course, the uh, the big thing is don't just vote. Get out there and organize others to vote. I was on the um, Black Tower radio show in Rochester this week, and um, they're highly interested. And, actually, they want to have Randy on there. i got to tell them that when he gets on now. Um, the Black Tower uh, AM local AM radio in uh, Rochester, upstate. Um, and there's there's great interest in this. And uh, also, Randy? Yes, sir. Welcome. Listen, I've just been on this Black Tower radio program in Rochester, and they absolutely want you on. Yes, and, I uh, spoke them last week. Next Tuesday right. I'm on, right? I believe so. Now, listen, you're you're in the Democratic primary now. Tell us, when is the Democratic primary? Uh, it is uh, September 9th. September uh, 9th. 30, and what do we have in New York? Do we have early voting? Do we have absentee voting? What do we you have? Know, I, I think so. I think that they have some, uh, you know, this is the primary. It's close to Democrats. Uh, it had to be uh, Democrats that registered uh, last October unless they were absolutely new. Uh, they yeah. could, uh, you couldn't switch your party, let's say four or five months ago. So, yeah, it's September 9th, I guess there's absentee, uh, absentee uh, balloting, uh, and military balloting and all of that, you know. Good. So we hope everybody's going to look into that and get those absentee ballots and remember early voting may also be a possibility, huh? Yes, yes. It's, it's usually a, a low turnout and the governor is, Embroiled in a major scandal right now, as you, uh, I'm sure, are aware well of. Tell us all about it, because this is not well, what you know, I didn't think of MSNBC. I, 
Oh, well, let me first of all, since we're both like uh, into uh, certain conspiracies, I think that the underlying there's there's an opening for Chuck Schumer, who's a Hillary uh, uh, friend, right? Very close, uh, and his protege is the U.S. Attorney here, and I think they found an opening to knock off the guy who may have been in her way in 2016, which is Andrew Cuomo. So that being said. Cuomo got himself in a real jam here. He put together a commission called the Moreland Commission, which is based on a 1914 act of state senator by the name of Moreland, I believe. And they use that to uh, to look at corruption. His father had a Moreland Commission, so they revive it every you know, 10, 20 years to look into corruption. And it's up to the governor. So they uh, prematurely shut it down. And through an exhaustive investigation by, you know, the New York Times, which really, because of his personality, they don't like him. And it turns out that uh, he was controlling it. He, you know, they were investigating some people close to him. And so he had some of his uh, bulldogs, uh, you know, uh, manhandle the, um, the commissioners, uh, which are mostly close friends who are district attorneys. None of them really good. You know, it's, it's really run by district attorneys. And so they were getting too close, some of them, and he got right in. He, he closed it down. Everyone, you know, uh, breathed a sigh of relief in the, uh, in the legislature because uh, they were afraid they were going to go after them. So now the U.S. attorney, Preet Bharaf, uh, who used to be uh, Chuck Schumer's uh, counsel, uh, found an opening, loves publicity, and he started investigating and after this big time story last week, uh, this huge time story, it was, on, it was three pages, two columns, top right-hand side uh, in the front, and then two full, and then another half a page in the back, all about uh, this uh, tendency of Cuomo to use and, and to intimidate and all of that. So now about a, four days goes by, he he's in hiding, and on Monday... He uh, went out at a press conference up in Albany, and he referred to some statements made by district attorneys on the committee that they were in support and said that they hadn't been uh, intimidated by him. Well, it turns out that over the weekend last weekend, uh, some of his aides went to those district attorneys with prepared statements to make. And it's kind of a quid pro quo because one of the one of the uh, commissioner's wife is a judge who's coming up for uh, to be reappointed uh, to a ten year term on the court of claims. Uh, so you know he's using carrots and sticks here uh, to get the, this uh, committee and the, some of the commissioners to say no, no, he was great with us. So the U.S. attorney. Uh, sent him a letter yesterday to Cuomo saying that he's tampering. And, you know, this looks like he may have crossed the line and committed a, an indictable offense. And so that's where it is right now. It has been unrelenting uh, in the press here, uh, this particular issue, this uh, whole scandal called Moreland Gate. And it looks like it's a lot worse than what happened uh, to uh, Governor Christie, or, you know, what's happening to Governor Christie and his participation in Bridgegate. So that's where we are right now, a really weakened governor, almost like the governor in Illinois, Blago. All right. I think this is extremely interesting. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with this, it's called the More Land Commission. Like you have land, but you want more land. Right. So the More right. Land Commission, which has been, uh, I guess, dissolved by Cuomo. Yes. But the, the big scandal from yesterday is that he was continuing to pay the executive director, some huge sum. $150,000 um, a year, yes. All right. But now what does this mean? That Randy Credico here is now on the ballot in an election in which Cuomo had been considered the overwhelming favorite. Maybe he's not so overwhelmingly favorite anymore, given this well, uh, I'm in dirty a laundry. Weird position right now. I'm in a very weird position. i got to be honest with you. There, there's me, and right now, uh, a woman who I met with uh, the other day had a two-hour meeting with, this Zephyr, Zephyr Teachout, who's adopting... Hang on, Randy. Hang on one second. We're going to just uh, finish up in the next segment, okay? Back in a minute. So the news from New York is that Andrew Cuomo, the governor trying for a second term, has hired a criminal lawyer to represent his office as a scandal grows over the Moreland Anti-Corruption Commission, 
which Cuomo is accused of turning into some kind of a vehicle for corruption. Now, Randy, we just have a couple of minutes, but you're telling us about yeah. Zephyr Teachout. What's right, your right, take? Right. So she, well, she next week is being challenged. I was able to get through uh, the challenging uh, period there. You know, I held my breath for about seven days, and I was the only one not challenged. Uh, there were a few others that were challenged who didn't have anywhere near what they needed to, to get on the ballot. Uh, and then you had Zephyr who had, you know, uh, like for a lot. She had done what she needed, but she appears to possibly be a resident from another state. So there's a court challenge uh, that commences, I think, Tuesday uh, here in New York State Court. And she could be very uh, easily thrown off the ballot. So that would leave, you know, Andrew Cuomo, who's scandal-ridden right now, and it's getting worse. And me, you know what I mean? I mean, it's an incredible, uh, you know, uh, dip of this moment right now uh, that I'm in this position to be, you know, the the one-on-one uh, candidate against Cuomo in a Democratic primary. All right, Randy, I have to tell you something. Now, I don't want to flatter you too much, but I reviewed uh, Zephyr for teachers uh, programmatic page and in particular this question of the wall street sales tax and i see on her original website she's got nothing about this that i could find but nevertheless now in the last uh, week or 10 days she started to talk about the need for a transaction tax yes. a, a securities uh, trading tax tobin yes. tax wall street sales tax uh, which you have been for all along. So you're well, a leader. She's a follower. My finding, answer. let me just tell you my finding, is that Credico is superior on all points as an alternative to Cuomo. In other words, if you want something that's as far away from Cuomo as you can get, it's Credico. It's not Zephyr Teacher. No, she, she, you know, she was an Obama supporter in 2012. She supported uh, – uh, in 2010, she supported uh, Andrew Cuomo. Uh, so, and she's not sure who she would support uh, if uh, you know she loses the primary. If she's in the primary, Cuomo or maybe the Green Party. The Green Party has fully adopted Wall Street sales tax. I've been talking to them. They will be pushing that in the uh, general election. Uh, if I'm knocked off the uh, the ballot, which you know most likely I will lose. September 9th. Oh, well, let's let's not uh, compromise the future here. This is well, uh, uh, time to reach for the stars because uh, that Moreland well, scandal. I'm, really, I'm out there. Believe me, I am exhausted from campaigning. You know, we spent the lion's share of the funds to get on the ballot. And, you know, we have uh, we have a strategy here. Uh, we believe that we can actually uh, pick up a lot of votes. In, and I believe if she gets knocked off the ballot, she's going to endorse me. I you hope so. so. That would uh, be very Jeffrey wise. Teach out would endorse me. Okay. Well, how can you endorse Cuomo at this moment? How could you with all those scandals? Randy, I'm sorry we got to run, but thank you very much. We want to get you can on we basically my every week. There and check me out? Until the primary, we want you, and hopefully all the way to November, we want you, given that optimistic scenario that we've just, yes. uh, we've just gone through. So it's Randy Credico 2014. Dot no. No. Credico2014.com. Okay. Credico2014.com. Credico2014.com. And there you can you can contribute. And of course, uh, the if big effort really was getting on the ballot. Wall Street sales tax. This is the time where we can really. I'm planning to put an ad together and run it about the Wall Street sales tax. And I need money so I can put it on the air. Fantastic. Well, well, we want to get you on here for that too. All right, Randy, thank you very much. Best of luck to you. More power to you. And look at this gift from fate in the form of Schumer (laughs) and his dirty networks. But still, uh, we'll take it, won't we? See you next week. Thank you very much, Webster. I want to thank your listeners, too, for their support. They've been tweeting out a lot. Uh, You know, they helped my website. They did my website, two of them, and uh, Chris Reed, who was out there, Bustin is, uh, you know, back uh, getting me petitioned. So I want to thank uh, your uh, listeners and supporters for all of the help hitherto. Certainly. Okay. And we'll see you soon. Uh, and maybe maybe some other uh, benefits of fate will come soon. So we'll see you next week. All right. Now we got to move on. Um, 
Just a couple of other notes, right? We, as I mentioned, this thing, the New York Fed says to Deutsche Bank, you are overexposed to derivatives, and this is a systemic breakdown threat. My God, what is that? This, I think, we have to put with um, Merkel's cell phone, the CIA snooping on Merkel. Um, this indicates the level of conflict between the U.S. and Western Europe. In other words, this bankrupt and, and unworkable, absurd, obsolete imperialist system is attempting to maintain itself now through intimidation. Intimidate Argentina, Germany, Russia, Greece, France. It's getting to be too much. Wait, wait for the Italians to get into the act and on and on. So, um, as we've pointed out, this is now the time for the full Glaziev. It's time for Russia to implement Capital controls and exchange controls. It may not be possible to maintain payments on dollar-denominated loans. If Argentina is in default, maybe that's uh, a club that other countries would want to join, right? What happens when the countries that are condemned by the imperialist system become the majority of the world? They, implicitly, they already are, right? You have the BRICS plus Argentina, plus France, plus Greece, these other countries that are being bashed and uh, mistreated inside the system uh, may decide that it's better to be outside the system. Capital controls, exchange controls, the possibility of default, the dumping of U.S. Treasury securities, and people should take that quite seriously, uh, and perhaps most dramatic, the need to seize one's own central bank and begin issuing a managed currency for production, low, low, extremely low interest rates, as close to zero percent as you can get, long-term maturities, and preferentially challenged, channeled into manufacturing, mining, agriculture, scientific research, space exploration, and other productive branches, and activate that BRICS bank. And again, Egypt and uh, the Gaza Strip, the Palestinians, uh, would be some of the first recipients uh, of the BRICS Bank once you get it going. You've got to use it uh, politically, obviously, not as a straight economic institution. And let me just point out the, uh, the, the one thing I neglected to mention about Hamas, right? If you are caught between Israel and Egypt, as the Palestinians in Gaza are, what kind of stupidity is it to think that you can antagonize both? You got to make you got to make friends with one or the other. And since it can't be the Israelis, it's got to be Egypt. What is Hamas doing? Instead, Haniye and his bankrupt leadership sending terrorists into the northern Sinai and and antagonizing the Egyptians. This is absolutely crazy. Uh, and we've had this big flare up this week of uh, the Israelis raving against Kerry. The, the interesting thing is that Kerry seems to have been implementing, at least in part, the uh, CIA Muslim Brotherhood Alliance, right? Hamas representing the Muslim Brotherhood, that somehow uh, the uh, critique, as, for example, by the neocon Krauthammer in the Washington Post this morning, August 1st, uh, he attacks Kerry for essentially playing into the hands of Hamas and offending Egypt, the Arab League, and the PLO. So that's an interesting aspect to the perfidy of Skull and Bones Kerry. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. Now let's say something about the, the World War I anniversary. It is too close for comfort. Uh, on the 28th, uh, Austria-Hungary declared war against... Serbia on the 30th, uh, the Tsar signed the Russian mobilization, which began on the 31st. Yesterday on the 31st, Jean Jaurès was assassinated. This was one of the great people of the uh, of, of this 20th uh, century. Jaurès had said. Uh, in his last speech in Brussels, right before the outbreak of the war, he had warned the ruling class of Europe. He said, you absolute masters should remember that the land is mined. Uh, 
in the mechanical drive and the thrill of the first clashes, if they manage to leave the mass to lead the masses into war, the horrors of war will develop. Typhus will compete with the work of the shells and bullets. Death and poverty will hit the men sobered and they will switch. They will turn around and say to the leaders of Germany, France, Russia, Italy, and say, why are you giving us all these corpses? And then the revolution will tell them, uh, it will tell them to uh, get out, you ruling classes, get out and ask pardon of God and men. And another, another one of his great quotes in that is, we don't know what secret treaties the governments have signed, including the French government. We only know one treaty, the one that binds us all to the human race. We don't know your secret treaties. That's Jaurès, therefore assassinated. Um, August 1st, uh, we've got the declaration of war by, Fran uh, by Germany against Russia. Germany mobilizes, France mobilizes, uh, Italy declares neutrality, Switzerland mobilized. This is also often uh, forgotten. On the 3rd of August, we have the m masterpiece of duplicity and perfidy by Sir Edward Grey. We've got on the same 3rd of August, the secret treaty, Germany and the Ottoman Empire, which brings us to the Middle East of today. Ottoman Empire enters the war on the side of Germany and... Uh, Germany declares war on France the 3rd of August. And remember, the key dates are really the mobilization dates, because under everybody's calculation, mobilization equals war. Now, um, Edward VII is the architect uh, and his networks. Right? People, people are accustomed to say the Schlieffen plan was the dead hand of Schlieffen running the German war effort of 1914. Fine. Up to a point. Similarly, Edward VII and his networks were the even more dead hand running the British policies through Sir Edward Grey. And it's the Kaiser himself who says Sir Edward Grey is the keeper uh, of the flame from Edward VII. He embodies the policy of encirclement. And you can, uh, you can do a pretty good... Uh, textual study on these different books, if they don't mention encirclement very much, then they're likely to be stacked in favor of the British. Now, there is this problem. Why did Germany encourage Austria-Hungary against uh, Serbia? You have to remember that uh, because of the uh, ramshackle makeup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and its various nationalities, um, this empire was uh, very vulnerable to the agitation of a country like Serbia, right, with this South Slav or Pan Slav um, emphasis. So therefore, they, the Austrians had reason to be scared, but the Germans also felt that the Austrians were softies, right? The Viennese were uh, too soft, and they, of course, you had two elements there, the Hungarian as well as the Austrian. So they, they had structural weakness built in. Here's the big thing. Germany was acting on the experience of what happened after the Buchlau bargain of 1908. Buchlau bargain, remember, is Volsky, agent of Edward VII, gets together with the uh, Ehrenthal, the Austro-Hungarian foreign minister, and he says, why don't you, or he actually says to them, why don't you uh, Austrians occupy an annex, annex, formerly Bosnia-Herzegovina, and we Russians will take uh, the Straits. And, of course, uh, Austria grabs Bosnia, but then uh, it's the British who say no on the, um, on, the, uh, on the Straits, right? They don't want the Russians to get control of the Bosporus and the Dardanelles. From this crisis, though, the Germans learned out of the turbulence after this that if Germany and Austria-Hungary put up a big bellicose facade – Russia would back down. Of course, the real reason is because the British are not going to support them in the effort. But uh, the Germans don't see it that way. They think that it's their own merit. So they're basically saying, let's play this one the way we played the Buchlau, the post-Buchlau turbulence. Germany and Austria-Hungary with a Nibelungen uh, united front will, uh, will make Russia back down. 
And, of course, the British had learned another lesson, right? The Sir Edward Grey and uh, even Edward VII had learned, especially from things like the first and second Moroccan crises, that if it's clear that England will go to war, then Grey, uh, that Germany will back down. And this is what the uh, the Kaiser actually uh, writes this. We have these these documents right here. When, when the uh, German emperor, William II, Kaiser Wilhelm, as we're going to call him, uh, he realizes that the British have got him in this trap. He writes these marginal notes, and these are highly interesting. Here's one on a dispatch, London, the 29th of July, 1914. He writes in the, in the, uh, the margin, instead of all these British attempts at mediation, a serious word to St. Petersburg and Paris to the effect that England would not help them would quiet the situation at once, right? It's true. It's in the hands of the British, whether there's a world war or not. And at the uh, end of the same dispatch, he writes again, Earl Grey knows perfectly well that if he were to say one single serious, sharp and warning word at Paris and St. Petersburg and were to warn them both to remain neutral, that both would become quiet at once. But he doesn't do that. He threatens Germany. He's a common cur. England alone bears the responsibility for peace and war. Of course, the element here is if Germany had also said something like that to Austria-Hungary, saying, look, don't start a war with Russia. You'll be on your own. Uh, that would also have quieted things uh, no end. But the, the, the danger there, of course, was the Germans felt they'd be left with no allies whatsoever. Notice also the deception postures that are inherent in these dispatches, right? You cannot take these World War I documents, interesting though they are, at face value. Remember that the British made four, count them, four mediation proposals during July, uh, and they kept going with the mediation proposals until the afternoon of July 29th. Uh, and then it was on the 30th that we have the various ultimatums, ultimata, Germany to France, stay out of this war, Germany to Russia, stop mobilizing, Germany to Belgium, let us come through. Um, and that what it reflects is that the German chancellor, it's, his name is written Bethmann, von Bethmann Holweg, von Bethmann Holweg uh, had built his policy on the idea the British are never going to come in. Look, they're only interested in mediating. Well, he fell victim to Perfide Albion, and he never learned his lesson as far as I can see. Now, um, <laughs> let's look then this outburst. I think the most interesting of all these things um, on a dispatch from um, uh, from Russia – the German ambassador in St. Petersburg to the German uh, foreign office. Well, we're going to have to give you this next week. But he says, uh, the encirclement of Germany had been set in motion by Edward VII. Edward VII is stronger after his death than I who am alive. And there are people who believe that the British could be won over or pacified by this or that puny measure. That's the final awareness of the German Emperor William II when it's too late and he's writhing in the net. We'll see you next week on World Crisis Radio.